This is episode 15 of the Magic Detective Podcast. On this episode, we talk about the early pioneers of mentalism. That and more on this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and this is episode 15 of the program. Um, I'm really excited to be at number 15. I've got some really great content for you today. However, before we start, I thought I would share a little bit of uh, current history with you. Uh, Recently, I received in the mail a book that is a magic history book. And it's by Tom Ewing. It's called Frederick Eugene Powell, Master of Magic and Mystery. And this book is awesome. Uh, I haven't finished it, but it's uh, so far it's really, really great. Uh, I love the cover on this book. It's a really striking image of Frederick Eugene Powell. And they've added a little bit of shadowing to it and uh, Powell's uh, uh, name in the background. It's really great. The the cover was done by uh, Nicole Martini, I believe that's her name, and uh, what a great job she did on the cover. And I did something with this book that I don't normally do, and that is, actually, maybe I should rephrase it, I didn't do something on this book that I normally do, and that is, uh, usually when I get a book, the first thing I do is flip through the pages before I start reading. This time I didn't do that. This time, every time, uh, as I'm reading, every time I turn a page, it's like a, you know, it's like Christmas morning, all these great images and pictures and posters and things. So it's really making the book even more exciting than, than usual. I can't uh, encourage you enough to go out and find this book. So please do that. And I did notice that the book is available through uh, quite a few different magic dealers. So pick up a copy of Frederick Eugene Powell, Master of Magic and Mystery by Tom Ewing, and you'll be happy you did. I was just thinking about it. It might be a good idea to see if I can get Tom to uh, maybe do an interview here on the podcast so we could have our own Powell episode. I'll look into that into the future, and Tom, if you're listening, if you want to reach out and contact me, uh, I would love to uh, interview you about about the book. It's great stuff. Uh, Another book I, I picked up recently, or actually came uh, in the mail recently was a book that is um, called The Magic Graveyard by Al the Only, Al Monroe. And this book deals with the graves in Lakeside Cemetery in Colon, Michigan that belong to magicians. There are, are quite a few of them. And what I like about the book is each grave has a biography with it. So you get to see a picture of who the performer was and, you know, biographical information and where the grave is located there within the cemetery. And there are some stories in there about other people from Colon. One of my favorite stories has to do with uh, where is is Percy Abbott buried. And that's a great, I'm not going to tip it. I'm not, you have to get this book for yourself because it's really a fascinating story. But uh, I really appreciate the book and I understand I I have uh, issue 20 or a copy that came out in 2017. And I believe that Al is working on an updated version. So um, uh, if you can try to get a copy of that book, it's really good. I think I mentioned this last episode, probably the episode before that, but we finally broke the thousand download mark. And obviously I'm excited about that. But we also hit the five star rating on iTunes. That is, um, that it, uh, okay. Well, I would be more excited except, um, my five star rating. I got that because five people gave me five stars. So, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so it's really, truly a five-star rating. And I do appreciate all the people that did that. That's fantastic. Uh, so here's what I'm asking. If you happen to listen to the podcast via iTunes and you wouldn't mind giving us a five-star rating also, that would be really greatly appreciated. Let's see, what else do we have before we get into the program today? Some programs uh, that I'm working on currently, uh, some future podcast episodes uh, a Blackstone Senior, 
which I think is going to be a two-parter easily. Uh, Blackstone Jr., uh, I just figured, hey, if I'm doing Blackstone Sr., why not do Blackstone Jr.? And uh, with any luck, I might be able to find somebody that I can interview about that. Hint, hint, hint. Let's see. Oh, uh, Anna Eva Faye, of course. I mentioned that. I kind of teased that before. That's still in the works. And I'm also going to do a second recollection of Doug Henning so that I can finish at least talking about the Doug Henning TV specials. Because I think I only got up to the fourth one, and there are several more. And great magic to talk about on those specials as well. And uh, let's see. What else do we have here? I think that's it. Um, today's topic is about um, the pioneers, early pioneers of mind reading. And mind reading, thought reading, all of this stuff comes out during the mid-19th century. And it's some of it's kind of tied to spiritualism in one way or another. And uh, it's, it's really fascinating how it all develops. Now, people like uh, Robert Houdin and uh, the great wizard of the North, John Henry Anderson and Robert Heller, they were doing second sight routines. But there was another form of thought reading or mind reading that developed in the uh, mid 19th century. And it was apparently the creation of one gentleman. And this particular uh, fellow, his name is John Randall Brown. And he was born October 28, 1851, in St. Louis, Missouri. And at a very young age, he develops this ability to find hidden objects merely by touching the person that hid the object. Because of this ability, it allowed him to do lots of different uh, effects, basically. Uh, according to author Barry Wiley, on August 5th, 1873... Brown gave a demonstration of his, what he called, find the pin routine to an informal group in a local saloon. And the audience was really impressed with his abilities. And before long, Brown quit working for his family business uh, to become an entertainer. And this was an entertainer with very unique abilities. And there's a, a slightly different story of that event, which was captured in the book Magic, a pictorial history of Conjurers in the Theater by David Price. Price says that John Randall Brown was working as a reporter for a Chicago newspaper when a fellow reporter got into an argument with Brown over his apparent claims. Uh, Brown was then challenged to demonstrate his skill or admit he was a fraud, and they chose a city block in which to do this in Chicago. Someone was asked to hide a small pin. Once this was done, Brown took the wrist of the person who hid the pin, he had himself blindfolded, and then he asked the person to concentrate on the pin's location, but do nothing else. And within minutes, a few minutes later, John Randall Brown walked to the exact location and found the hidden pin. This, like the story before, caused a huge sensation. Brown quit the newspaper business and went into show business. At least this is... Uh, the story that was in that book. Now, if you're wondering which of the versions is correct, I'll tell you. John Randall Brown was never a newspaper man working for a Chicago newspaper. However, that is the story that Brown told other people. So that's how that came about. Apparently in the 1870s, he became quite a popular attraction. He developed a show that was two hours long. Half the show was conjuring, the other half had his mind-reading effects, and his feats were so astonishing that no less than Yale University and the University of Michigan tested his abilities to see if they were genuine. Their conclusion? John Randall Brown could read minds. And if I might step in here just a moment to remind you, Brown was a stage mind-reader not a real mind reader. He had no supernatural abilities. He did have his secrets, but they didn't stay with him. Uh, he developed something called CMR. It's also called psychophysiological thought reading. That was the technique that he developed that allowed him to do various effects that appeared like mind reading. In 1889, Brown created a new sensation 
that would be the closer to his show for the rest of his career. He called it the wire test. It was elaborate by today's standards, uh, but very diabolical in its approach. He would have a wire run from the stage to a location some 100 yards or so away. Uh, a member of the audience, and usually this member of the audience was like a celebrity or a local politician or something, they would be asked to stand at this far distant location and they would hold the end of a wire. And then they were asked to think of a three-digit number, not write it down or anything, just think of a three-digit number. Now, Brown, uh, being on stage and in front of the audience, would then grab the wire and he would hold it up to his forehead. After a few minutes, Brown would then begin to write down the three-digit number on a chalkboard in front of everyone. Then he would spin the board over backwards so it could not be seen. A messenger would be sent to get the spectator back into the theater. As the spectator came upon the stage, Brown would ask what was the number, and the person would reveal it. The number matched the one that Brown had written down just minutes before most of the time. Apparently, the method was not surefire, and he did have some spectacular failures. To ensure his success rate was going to be higher in the future, Brown turned to an alternative method, uh, though this routine was the same. And this worked for a period of time until even that method was revealed to a newspaper reporter who then exposed it in the press. Darn you newspaper people! Towards the end of his career, Brown was struggling. At some points, it's reported that he wasn't making much more than the average worker. A tour of Europe helped to replenish some of his losses, but by the 1920s, he was all but finished. He retired to Minneapolis, Minnesota, and took odd jobs as a photographer. During the height of his career, he had such notable fans as Mark Twain and Eli Whitney, John Randall Brown died on July 3rd, 1926. He was only 75 years old when he passed. Now, if I might backtrack just a little, in 1877, Brown hired an assistant named Washington Irving Bishop. This man, Bishop, previously worked for Anna Eva Fay. Mr. Bishop, after being in the employ of John Randall Brown for a year discovered the secrets used by Brown and left to do his own show. Unlike Brown, Bishop was very innovative and created an even bigger sensation. And I want to talk more about Bishop, but I'm going to save him till the end, so I'm going to kind of skip around here a little bit. Instead, I want to mention a third gentleman who was hired by Bishop as an assistant. His name was Charles Garner, and he was born in England in 1857, he worked with Bishop just long enough to also learn the technique. Uh, he wasn't taught the technique. He just kind of gathered it, you know, pieced it together by watching Bishop work. Uh, and though it appears he didn't actually uh, leave Bishop willingly. Instead, he was left behind. Bishop learned his technique, again, by watching, uh, or I'm sorry, Bishop learned his technique by watching Brown, and Garner learned his technique by watching Bishop. They had that in common, at least. And years later, Brown would actually claim he taught both of them the technique. Charles Garner did have one small problem, and that was class status. He was the son of a butcher and not in the wealthy class of society. He got a taste of the rich life while working with Bishop, and he was amazed at what he saw. After being left on his own, he decided to take the knowledge he had gained from his employment with Washington Irving Bishop and use it to move up in society. The first thing he had to do, though, was change his name. He settled upon the name Stuart Cumberland, and then he began to formulate a show, and he returned to England. The early version of his show consisted primarily of spiritualistic exposures. Um, the reason being it was easier to get started with a show doing this than, the, than the, any of the thought reading stuff, which he hadn't quite gotten down completely. Then as his abilities increased, he added the thought reading effects. His first outing was when he rented the Steinway Hall for two performances, and both performances were poorly attended. And the debut of Stuart Cumberland was 
well, it was a flop. Shortly thereafter, uh, to try and regain some publicity for himself, he set about to sue a local medium for taking money under false pretenses. However, the medium and her lawyer apparently knew about Cumberland's past as Charles Garner and were prepared to expose him. Talk about somebody turning the tables on you. So uh, Cumberland Garner dropped the charges. In order to remedy his entire situation, Cumberland decided to focus on, on thought reading instead of just the spiritualist stuff. He billed himself as Mr. Stuart Cumberland, the celebrated English thought reader. He claimed he was able to divine thought by physical agency. And the latter part of his show was the exposition of occult phenomenon. Cumberland disclaimed any supernatural abilities and said he was no mystic. Contrast this with Bishop's approach, uh, where he would imply there were um, these things were otherworldly. And by the way, Bishop was also in England at the same time and even attended several of Cumberland's early performances. And Bishop apparently thought very little of Cumberland's feeble attempts. They were presenting similar routines, but in vastly different styles. Bishop had a very grand, um, maybe even flamboyant approach. Cumberland, uh, his approach was much more reserved. Now, they both uh, featured um, the before-mentioned find-the-pin routine uh, that came straight out of John Randall Brown's act. Uh, they would also do a thought reading with a banknote. And uh, what this is, I've seen this demonstrated before, uh, and the way it appears is this, a spectator holds onto a bill and can clearly see, the spectator can clearly see the number on the bill. The performer holds the spectator's wrist, but the bill is out of his view. And he points to a board that's full of numbers. And by putting his hand upon the, uh, the number that the spectator is thinking of, that's how they're able to reveal, uh, the serial number. Um, Cumberland eventually found his audience, and his fame began to rise. He presented a seance in the House of Commons and chose to read the thoughts of Mr. William Gladstone, who was the then Prime Minister. Whenever he would perform for royalty or someone famous like author Alexander Dumas, he made sure to have an artist rendering created for his brochures that captured these special moments. This was before photography was so widespread. Stuart Cumberland died in London, England in 1922. So now let's get back to Bishop. He was born March 4th, 1856 in New York. He was named after his godfather, Washington Irving. And Irving, of course, was the author of such titles as The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle. Washington Irving Bishop's parents were both devout spiritualists. His mother, Eleanor, was a practicing medium. His life was fairly ordinary at first. He went to college, got a job, but he quit that job after seeing Anna Eva Fay perform. In fact, he approached her for a job and later became Fay's manager for a short time. In 1876, the wheels came off the cart, so to speak, when an exposure of Anna Eva Fay's act appeared in the newspaper. The material was supplied by... Washington Irving Bishop. He immediately went out on his own. In 1877, he met John Randall Brown, where he became an assistant and soon learned Brown's act better than Brown knew it. Bishop started out performing in England and the British Isles. And it wasn't completely smooth sailing in England, as he ran into some people who wanted to expose him, among them the owner of Egyptian Hall, John Neville Maskelin. Bishop billed himself as the Enigma of the 19th Century. His full title was Mr. Washington Irving Bishop, first and world eminent demonstrator of the phenomenal power of thought reading. It's a pretty good title, if you ask me. 
Like his two contemporaries, Cumberland and Brown, he also did the find the pin trick and reading the numbers off a banknote. He also did another routine, which was uh, recreating a crime. And in this, what he did was he had members of the audience choose who would be the person who was murdered, who would be the murderer, and what the murder weapon was. And using his technique, he was able to decipher all these things. And when I read that, I kind of made me chuckle a little bit because I remember uh, on a, um, a much more 20th century, I think it was 20th century, uh, audio uh, CD that I heard that Banachek had done, he talked about the, uh, the assassination game, which was basically uh, the same thing that uh, Washington Irving Bishop was doing almost 100 years before. So a lot of these same themes continue on to today. One routine that seems to be original to Bishop is the blindfold drive. Now his version of the blindfold drive is very different than the modern day version. I'll explain them both in just a moment. First off, in Bishop's version, he combined the uh, kind of the hide the pin sort of effect along with the blindfold drive. So what would happen is, is somebody would be uh, selected to hide something within the city that person would come back, they would sit in a horse-drawn carriage next to uh, Washington Irving Bishop, he would be blindfolded, and then he would take off uh, with this uh, team of horses going at breakneck speed uh, to find whatever the object was. So he's, he's driving the horse-drawn buggy, he's going super fast, he's blindfolded at the same time, and he's trying to find a hidden object which uh, he eventually does. Now, in the modern-day version, um, it's usually just a sightless vision sort of thing. So a magician or mentalist will say that they're going to drive a car blindfolded, and that seems to be enough. And, and it's impressive either way, but I think it's more impressive the way that uh, Washington Irving Bishop did it. He also, uh, besides wearing a blindfold when he did it, he wore a hood. So uh, now you know where that comes from. When Bishop eventually returned to America, he signed with Mr. M.B. Levitt, the great American theatrical manager. Levitt had tried to sign him sooner, but uh, Bishop was already engaged with another theatrical manager at the time. So now it was his opportunity to work with Levitt, and he started to tour all over the country. At one point, he was actually supposed to go to Australia, but um, there's a bit of confusion as to why he didn't go, but he eventually... Uh, ended up in a tour of Mexico. And for some reason, I'm not clear on it, he broke the contract with Levitt while on tour in Mexico. And because of this, he ended up making even more money than uh, he anticipated while there. Fast forward to the night of May 12, 1889. Washington Irving Bishop has been asked to perform before the prestigious Lambs Club in New York City at 70 West 36th Street, New York, New York. The Lambs Club was the first professional theatrical club in America. Over the years, some of the famous members have included John Barrymore, W.C. Fields, Will Rogers, Cecil B. DeMille, George M. Cohen, Fred Astaire, John Philip Sousa, Cliff Robertson, John Wayne, Charlie Chaplin, and many more. Bishop was asked to perform for the top tier of theatrical entertainers, and he gladly agreed. He performed a number of unbelievable mind-reading effects with the use of his CMR technique. And then, get this, then he collapsed. He fell to the ground unconscious. A friend of Bishop's mem mentioned that his friend was probably okay. He apparently suffered from something called catalepsy. Now, the definition of catalepsy, it's, it's a noun, it, it's a physical condition usually associated with catatonic schizophrenia characterized by suspension of sensation, muscular rigidity, and often by loss of contact with the environment. This was not the first time Bishop passed out during a performance, and because of this he carried a note in his breast pocket explaining the situation and informing whoever found him that under no circumstances should an autopsy be performed. 
Bishop woke up a short time later and actually requested to finish his performance. But before he got too far, he was out again. This time, however, he did not wake. Attending doctors eventually pronounced him dead in the early morning. Bishop's wife was notified, and the following day she came to see her dead husband at the funeral home. And when she saw her husband's body, she was mortified because an autopsy had been performed. His skull had been cut open and his brain removed. She had been yelling, they've killed my husband. It is very likely that Washington Irving Bishop was still simply in a cataleptic trance. The doctors who examined him in the early morning said no note was found on his body. Possibly they found the note after they had begun the autopsy. This is shocking. But the story doesn't end there. If the wife was angry, it was nothing compared to Eleanor Bishop, the mother. She wanted answers. Why was an autopsy done? Who stole her son's brain? She asked for a coroner's inquiry, so a second autopsy was done. The missing brain was actually located in the chest cavity of Bishop, uh, but no cause of death could be discovered. Duh. Uh, Later, she had charges brought against the doctors that were involved. Unfortunately, they encountered a hung jury, and the doctors were all released. Mrs. Eleanor Bishop was kind of a unique uh, person. She made countless outlandish claims throughout her life, Uh, things like being friends with Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, William McKinley. She claimed she was owed countless millions of dollars, and on and on the tales went. Apparently, none other than Harry Houdini came to her aid later in life, and he would purchase items from Bishop's collection to help out the mother. When she passed, Houdini found out he was the sole beneficiary of her $300 million estate. Except, there was no money to be had. Washington Irving Bishop died May 13, 1889. He's buried in the Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, New York. On the top of his grave are the words, The Martyr, because his mother, Eleanor Fletcher Bishop, always felt that he was killed by the doctors rather than having died of some other disease. And these are the three pioneers of mind reading. It's interesting to me how tied together they are. One worked for the other and worked for the other. And then near the end, uh, John Randall Brown took credit for training the other two. It's just amazing how their lives intersect. And it all came from this one technique that eventually would be expanded upon. And there are you know, countless techniques in the world of mentalism and mind reading today. There's another fellow that kind of uh, touches the world of these three gentlemen, and that is Samory Baldwin. Uh, but I don't want to go into his life uh, today, uh, but he does have something to do with these three, just a, just a minor little incident, uh, which I will talk about in a future episode because I find uh, Mr. Baldwin to be very fascinating. He was known as the White Mahatma, and uh, he was a friend of Houdini and many others, and he's actually said to be the first person to do a handcuff escape, so in regards to, in a magical uh, format. So uh, lots, uh, lots to work on here in the future, but I hope you enjoyed the episode here on the pioneers of mind reading. I think I'm going to do another podcast also on the mind reading teams like the the Zanzigs and Robert Houdin and his son and Robert Heller and Haiti Heller. You had all these teams that did Second Sight and they're probably worthy of a a podcast as well down the road. So uh, it's a little harder for me to find information on the mentalists than it is ma- magicians. This was a, a bit of a challenge, but I, uh, I always like a challenge. So I hope you enjoyed the episode. Now, I do want to bring up something. I brought this up in the past, and that is a Magic Detective uh, podcast contest. So guess what? Here's a contest. I'm going to give the first ever contest right now. And here's the question. Name the congressman that wrote the anti-fortune-telling bill in 1926 that Houdini was part of. That's it. That's it. All you have to do, if you know the answer to that, send me an email at info at carnegiemagic.com. 
and just put in the subject uh, heading, just write contest, and then put your answer in, whoever you think it is. The first, um, it's a pretty easy, pretty easy question. So I'm going to go with the, um, the fifth person that submits the correct answer will be the winner, and you will receive an authentic piece of magic history from my collection. Um, when will I do the drawing? Well, actually, you know what? Once I get the fifth one, I will, uh, I will announce the winner on the next podcast if we get a winner by then. If we don't, if there's uh, only one or two people, I'll probably cancel the contest and do a different one next month, um, just so you know, because I, uh, I'm anxious to do the contests again. So that's it. That's it for episode 15 of the Magic Detective Podcast. Thank you for listening. And please don't forget to like the episode. And if you could um, leave a comment, I always appreciate comments. And subscribe or follow is uh, always appreciated as well. And we will see you next time. I'm Dean Carnegie, the Magic Detective. I'll see you next time here on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs>